The Carnival Destiny will be the second ship to have Lynn Arison as the godmother. Nearly 25 years ago, at a shipyard in Tilbury, England, Lynn broke the traditional bottle of champagne across the bow of the Empress of Canada, officially renaming her the Mardi Gras. Now it is my distinct pleasure and privilege to introduce to you the godmother of the Carnival Destiny, Mrs. Lynn Arison. this morning and beautifully warm yesterday and very clear. It is to remind me of 25 years ago when I took the neck of a champagne bottle and crashed it against the flagpole in the forward part of the Empress of Canada naming her Mardi Gras. There are several people here that were there 25 years ago. I came to Crossroads in my life uh, in 1971. And at that point, uh, by sheer coincidence, a friend of mine, who had a very good uh, school uh, buddy of mine, called me up and told me that he has got a ship and he doesn't know what to do with it. Well, I guess it all started when uh, Ted Arison uh, had a management team and no company. Uh, it was in the fall of 1971. Uh, Arison Shipping Company, which the DBA was Norwegian uh, Caribbean Line at the time, had separated from Canoe Kloster, the owner of the vessel. Uh, he had a loyal management team, but he, he had no ship. So I sent somebody over to check the ship, and I called him back and said, you know what, sink that ship. <laughs> uh, finally, I sold it for him uh, as scrap. And at that point, I said, my God, if you're interested, have I got a deal for you? I've got a whole staff of people, and uh, we don't have a ship, but we need a ship. So we made a deal that uh, I'll buy a ship, and he, I'll, I'll give her my staff, and we'll create a subsidiary of AITS, and this ship will start a new cruise line. So we went to Europe and uh, found the Empress of Canada, which was a transatlantic uh, liner that was built in uh, 1960. And he convinced his friend, Mishulam Rickless, to fund the venture and set up a company called Carnival Cruise Lines. The Empress of Canada was a magnificent ship and I absolutely fell in love with that ship. I knew this is it and uh, I decided this is what I want to buy and eventually we bought her and uh, she was the Mardi Gras from the beginning of Carnival Cruise Lines. The Mardi Gras in fact was an old Atlantic liner, the Empress of Canada, which was laid up and out of work and Mr. Harrison had great foresight to take her, laid up, bring her to Miami, give her a couple of coats of paint, refit her, and send her to the tropics. And so began the history of Carnival Cruise Lines, which has been the greatest success in the history of the ocean liner business. The ship was brought into service in March of 1972, and it ran aground on its maiden voyage. The drink of the day was Mardi Gras on the rocks. It was a very inauspicious beginning. It made uh, all the papers around the world. Here was this very large ship aground within sight of uh, Miami Beach. It was uh, embarrassing to say the least. It was like a bad dream. I, I recall everything. I was on, uh, on the bridge the whole time. Next day, Lynn came and asked me to please come down and go to sleep a little. And I couldn't. I guess if, thinking about the beginning, it was really a, an issue of, of survival. I mean, how does uh, a, a group of people with the oldest ship in the business, the Mardi Gras in those days, uh, how do we uh, do what we need to do to survive and grow in a business where our competitors seemed uh, to have overwhelming advantages? And uh, in 1972, when we started with the Mardi Gras, and the, the, the difficulty that she had in the beginning from the grounding to uh, a long cruise to Israel back in the fall of 73. There was a period of a couple of years where really it didn't look like we were going to survive. It was uh, quite a, a rough situation in the beginning uh, uh, to start a cruise line without money. There was so little money back then that, uh, and we had no credit. So when the ship went to St. Thomas and uh, wanted to fuel, uh, they wouldn't give credit uh, to Ted and the company. So Ted had to go through 
uh, all the cash registers at the bars on board and scrounge around to get enough money to get the fuel payment. Had he not made the fuel payment, the ship would still be there today and there would be no Carnival Cruise Lines. My aspirations was, at that time, to get one more ship because uh, one ship company is no good. If anything happens to that ship, you're out of business. Ted, very much like a gambler, put the profits for 1975 right back into an investment in the new ship, which was the Empress of Britain, which became the Carnival. I'll never forget January 1st, 1976, was the Carnival steamed into port. And it was the sorriest looking thing, I have to say that. It was listing. Rust was streaking down from the sides all over the place. You know, you didn't know whether to cheer or cry when the ship came in. We took delivery of her in the port of Miami on January 1st, uh, 1976. I remember it as if it was yesterday. Uh, we went on board the ship. It was in, uh, just in total disrepair. Uh, we were standing in a main lounge in about four inches of water, uh, six or seven of us with Ted and Mickey. And Ted said, uh, yes, right here, this is going to be the casino. And we had six weeks to get the ship ready. It was a huge job. They had a, they were, we were adding cabins. We were carping everything, refurbishing everything, creating the show lounge redoing the restaurant, creating a disco, uh, taking promenades which were, oh, just a total wreck and trying to give them some semblance of a, of a luxury feel. And uh, I don't know how we did it, really. We were just really trying to figure out how to get from one payroll to the next. That started to change a little bit when we, we got the Carnival, although it still wasn't the product we would have liked to have been able to introduce, but we didn't have the capital available to do much more. We took a ship that was laid up for a very long time with a lot of problems, and were able to clean it up sufficiently that we were able to operate it and, and make money uh, right away, but uh, still, uh, survival was the primary issue. So I figured with two ships, uh, and then after we had two ships, said, you know, if we had three, then we are really protected. So we went for the third ship, when the Festival came in, she was significantly larger than any other ship operating from the port of Miami, and we made a lot of uh, headway with that. I think things changed uh, dramatically when we bought the Festival. We did have the capital available to do a major refit in Japan. Parts of the ship were almost like a new ship, and really a product that we could be proud of, and it, and it began the whole concept of, of whether we were going to be able to build the kind of ship to really take advantage of uh, the concept of the fun ship cruise experience and, and to really reach the broad North American market. Since the very first cruise, we'd always actually developed a fun ship product. Uh, the crew on board always had a great rapport with the passengers. So we took that into the marketing and used the slogan, the fun ship, in our marketing and advertising. Cruise a fun ship, sail a carnival cruise. You'll love a Bob to this day believes that he was the one that developed the fun ship theme. But of course, we did that in Boston, you know, uh, almost at the beginning. Uh, the original theme for the ships were the Golden Fleet. And that's when they had only one ship. They called it the Golden Fleet. And uh, we changed that to the fun ships uh, not that far after we took, uh, took over uh, the advertising for the company. And as, sort of like as soon as he realized it was a success, it became his idea. It became his idea right. when it became exactly. a success, right. Yeah. You know, the Carnival story is really a textbook uh, marketing case. Uh, here's a company that was uh, at the bottom of the ladder of its industry and over the years worked its way up to be the most popular cruise line in the world. Now, how did they do that? Well, they picked the positioning way back when, the fun ship positioning, and they have been focused Everything they have done has been consistent with that positioning. And then suddenly with three ships, we were a substantial part of the cruising scene. And I'm looking around and everybody else has fairly new ships. And my ships were not so new. You know, it's about time to start building our own ships. And from the acquisition of, of the Carnival and the Festival came a, a brand new ship called the Tropical, which was so unbelievable to us because we had we had been operating older vessels that had other lives and all of a sudden uh, Mr. Harrison 
uh, donated a brand new ship to our fleet, which made us all feel like we were uh, pregnant fathers and mothers uh, accepting delivery of this new baby. The Tropical was somewhere between the new generation of ship and old generations of ship. It was our first new ship. It was the first ship that we began to work with the modern techniques of shipbuilding. And we built a good ship. In the early 80s, when we introduced the, the Tropical, uh, we made the decision to build three brand new ships, now known as really as the holiday class of, of vessels. And that really was a huge, huge step for us. It was a commitment of nearly half a billion dollars in, in new buildings at a time where, where nobody was building ships in that, that kind of uh, mentality of more than one contract at a time. It was clear how much we had learned from the building of the Tropical and how that worked its way into the design of the, of the holiday. Uh, the single promenade, using that promenade as a public space. I mean, to me, I think that's the greatest single feature that uh, Carnival has introduced into the, the cruise ship market. We realized we had to reach a far greater uh, part of the potential traveling market, and that's when we uh, focused on, on television advertising and hired Kathy Lee, I think, in, uh, in early 1984. Uh, that decision was taken, and we, we were on network television in the middle of 1984. Clearly, that had a huge impact on the brand, and cruising in general uh, just exploded from the exposure that that campaign and the success of that campaign. In the morning, in the evening, ain't we got fun? Not much money, oh, but honey, ain't we got fun? The food is great here, there's never a bill. We'll stay up late, dear, let's not miss a thrill. Sunny weather, all together, we've got the fun. Uh, we looked at 200 female spokespersons, and we finally narrowed it down to about five. I remember it was Joyce DeWitt and Bernadette Peters and Sandy Duncan and Kathy Lee Crosby and, and this person named uh, Kathy Lee Johnson. And so we submitted, we came over here to Carnival and, and said, okay, here are the five choices. And, and we eliminated Joyce DeWitt really couldn't sing, but she could dance. And, and uh, Bernadette Peters hated the sun and got seasick. And Sandy Duncan was... Uh, pregnant at the time, and, and Kathy Lee Crosby a little too racy, so Mickey said, what, what about that second banana on, on Good Morning America, uh, Kathy Lee Johnson? And we all thought that was a terrific idea, so Kathy Lee Johnson was the person we selected. Uh, she was, from our standpoint, uh, the ideal choice for a spokesperson. Uh, she's friendly, perky, energetic. She's attractive to men and yet non-threatening to women. That's kind of a difficult thing to do, but she uh, manages to, uh, to walk that fine line. And we had her uh, singing and dancing and entertaining, but at the same time explaining to, at that time, the 97% of the American public had never been on a cruise, uh, what cruising's all about and the fact that your meals included your daytime activities and nighttime entertainment, etc. So she kind of explained cruising. At the same time, uh, through a perkiness and entertainment, uh, hopefully made it fun. I remember the first time I met Kathy Lee Johnson was up in the studio with uh, director Steve Miner. And we were waiting for her to appear, and all of a sudden, the star arrives. And here's this little person, Kathy Lee Johnson, and she says to me, I'm sorry I'm late. I have voice, voice notes. The first person I met, uh, basically, when we started the, the, uh, the whole relationship was Bill Dreyer with the advertising agency, and he became Billy Baloney first day. And um, I had the worst allergy attack, as I remember, uh, that I'd had in my whole life. And, and we, I showed up for the recording session going, Hi, I'm Kathy Lee, it's so nice to meet you. I'm, I'm a singer. I'm going to be doing all the, the singing there. And he, he, he gave me a look like, I'm going to die. I'm going to be kicked out of the advertising field. I'm never going to work again. And somehow, the, 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 yes, the sky opened, my voice cleared, and I sang, in the morning, in the evening, ain't we got fun? And it was wonderful from the very first day. The next uh, three years, from 1984 to 1987, we doubled in size uh, with the addition of the Holiday Jubilee and Celebration. We went from carrying 249,000 passengers in 1984 uh, to just about 500,000 passengers in 1987. And so began a generation of purposely built cruise ships. Again, huge wedding cake ships with pools and saunas and discos. 
multi-level lounges, and she spawned a successful series of liners, like the Celebration, the Jubilee, and the Holiday. And then we came to the wonderful Fantasy class, which in 1990, at 70,000 tons, was the largest cruise ships afloat. And today, they are the largest series of cruise ships, a series of sisters. With the success of the holiday class and the success of the television advertising campaign, it was clear to us that to continue uh, growing this concept, we we're going to have to build better and larger ships, and the capital requirements for that were going to be extraordinary. We did sign a contract for the Fantasy, and then set out to do a public offering in 87, which really allowed us to sign the contracts for uh, Ecstasy and Sensation. It turned into a class of ship that by uh, 1998 we will have eight of them, I think it's probably uh, the most successful uh, class of sister vessels ever built in, in, in the passenger cruise industry. After the fantasy and ecstasy were in the water, we determined that the success of that design was really quite strong, so we went ahead and then ordered the uh, fascination, and then the imagination, and then the inspiration. We were fortunate that, uh, that the family that owned Holland America uh, was interested in selling and, and were able to acquire the Holland America brand with their Holland America West Tours, Alaska infrastructure, as well as Windstar Cruises. And later we added Seaborn to the mix, really diversifying the product mix uh, that we had. And now we really start taking advantage of all the potential cruisers out of North America. About six years ago or so, uh, Ted Arison had the idea to build a new class of uh, carnival ship. And what he did was he created a memo that was sent out to all the department heads, to the naval architects, and to myself. And the basic message of this memo was that everyone should create a wish list for all the things that they would like to see put into a ideal cruise ship, let's say. And the result of that memo uh, is the Carnival Destiny today and what will be her sister, the Carnival Triumph. Now we have the Carnival Destiny, which surpasses the record set by the old Queen Elizabeth, which was 83,000 tons and for over 50 years was the largest liner ever built, but now surpassed by the 100,000 plus tons of this magnificent floating palace now sitting in New York Harbor at the start of a fantastic career and a new chapter in ocean liner history. Now we have uh, the seventh and eighth sisters, Elation and Paradise. Uh, ready to join us in 1998. I think the most important thing really is people. Management can think, management can try and direct, management can try and be innovative, but it needs people to execute. And I always tried to run a company like a family because I wanted everybody to feel that he shares in it and he shares in the success. You're going to see the same faces that you've seen many, many years ago. They don't change. You take uh, Mike Zodis, who is very much responsible for the growth of the company. He's with me from day one. People like Bob Dickinson, from day one. You have somebody like Mickey Harrison. Since he started working, he never left. Take Captain Fabietti, for example. He's with us from the beginning, too. He was the first staff captain of the Mardi Gras. Uh, or take Zamati. One day I said uh, to one of our people, I would like to start bringing in young kids because they'll have to stay with us a long time. So we went looking at the uh, uh, University of Miami and we picked up uh, Zamati. He was a kid just finishing college. I came to Carnival really when Carnival didn't exist. Back in 1970, I answered an ad in the Herald relative to people joining the sales and marketing team at the Arison Shipping Company. Next thing I knew, I was sitting in front of Ted Arison, and he sort of looked at me and asked me a couple of questions and said, listen, if you, if you really feel like you want to come to work and make minimal money and uh, really prove yourself, I want to be able to form a very young and aggressive sales management team. So if you'd like to join us, it's okay with me. The next thing I knew, here we were operating a cruise ship called the Mardi Gras. That was 1972. And from there, when you reflect to those days, to 1972 to 1996, the mind just boggles. When you talk about the, the people at Carnival, 
clearly we've had a group of people that have been here a long time. And the advantage of that is, is that, that so many of them know what you think before you think it. And that creates an ability to, to work together, a kind of teamwork that can only be uh, created in time. And uh, we have so many people that have been here actually from the very beginning, and if not from the beginning, from really the early stages, and have been a part of the growth of the company from the very beginning. That's what sets Carnival apart from its competitors and from any other company in the leisure field. Ted started actually with a very small number of employees, uh, probably no more than 30, and we now have something like 1,500 shoreside employees. What's been remarkable about all this is many of those employees are still with us. We have clerks that started in the early 70s at 140 and 150 dollars a week who are now vice presidents of the company. At that time there were three of us in the RC department and we were at 820 Biscayne Boulevard. We actually didn't have much space so the RC department was in the fire escape. It makes me happy to know that 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 I'll have friendships that will last for the rest of my life and people that I've truly been proud to be associated with and very grateful to be a part of their lives. I'm very proud of what's happened in the cruising industry, but I'm more proud of the friendships that I've developed over the years. I think what's important is uh, virtually every day in this job, a lot of people uh, laugh and have a good time. Uh, we're serious about our job, but we don't take ourselves too seriously. I had gone to a seminar where Bob was speaking, and I was a travel agent at that time working for Ask Mr. Foster. And I heard Bob Dickinson speak, and I thought, this man is dynamic. I want to work for him. Uh, there's a lot of kidding, and there's a lot of humor, and that makes the work environment to me very, very pleasant. It's tempting to say that the reason for Carnival's success is the management and the loyal employees and the great hardware. But really, in the end of the day, it's the customer. The customer didn't buy our product. If he is if she wasn't happy with our product, we wouldn't be successful. So it's those millions of people that come on Carnival Cruises. They're what make us the most popular cruise line in the world and a success. I never thought that we would become the biggest cruise line in the world. It's been a great ride the whole way. How great it is to work for a company that makes money. It's not just a job anymore. I mean, I feel like I was, I was born here, literally. My entire adult life has been spent at Carnival Cruise Lines. It's always been a, a goal of mine to wake up in the morning and, and feel that I want to get to work as soon as possible because I've many things to do. And I still exist today. Every day, I say thanks for Carnival Cruise Line. Make my family feel happy every day. You can tell that it's a different kind of company because the people love it so much. It's the teamwork that really pulls this company together. I have been working for this company since 1972. I joined the company when the, we was poor. Now we are very rich. I started with Carnival in June of 1972 as a bar waiter on what was then the flagship of the Golden Fleet, the Mardi Gras. The dining rooms on our first ships were certainly not like this. I want to say, like, thanks to everybody, you know, that had made Carnival what is Carnival, because Carnival is very special, you know? We've grown to the size we are, but still have that same, that same uh, feeling amongst the employees. This is an amazing company, and for me, it's been the best 20 years of my life. It's like a dream come true. I never dreamed that I would be in this position today. After 21 years of Carnival Cruise Line, they give me a nice present, and they give me this big baby. You know, when you work for a company for 16 years, like I have, you make a lot of really good friends. It is a family, but uh, not only do you work, but you also live with everybody all the time, uh, and you get many, many close uh, friendships. It's really more than a company. It's, it's a way of life. It's a family. Uh, people really care about the people here. I think that's what makes Carnival so special. We still believe that this is a, uh, a company and an industry that has uh, tremendous potential. Uh, and we're going to do everything we can to, uh, to garner as much of that potential as possible. It, it, it's an evolution. It's one thing after another, one step after the other. I never ever in my life thought that we'll reach uh, this incredible magnitude. Never. When you have an anniversary like this, you begin to take stock. William Blake said, great things are done when men and mountains meet. And I think that you're seeing one of the greatest things that have happened in the cruise industry 
this exquisite ship that I wish fair winds, calm seas, and a beautiful future to give passengers a very happy and fun cruise. I'm very proud. I don't think anybody has done what we've done to start with one old ship and build itself to such a crescendo. For me, it's a certain nostalgic and sad feeling for some reason. You try to remember back to the beginning and the Mardi Gras is no longer with us, you know. So something is missing along the way, but um, that's the way life is, I suppose. Carnival. Cheers, Carnival. It's been fun. Happy anniversary, Carnival! Happy, Happy anniversary, anniversary Carnival. Carnival. It's been a wonderful 17 years. Happy anniversary, Carnival. Happy anniversary. 25 years. 16 for me, too. Happy, Happy anniversary, anniversary Carnival. Carnival! Cheers to Carnival for a great 25 years. Congratulations, Congratulations Carnival, for 25, 25 years. years. I've been here 17 years with Carnival. I've grown up here. Happy anniversary. It's been the best years of my life. Happy anniversary, Carnival! I've only been here eight years, and they said I had to be here 15 years or I couldn't do this, so I said I'd just be a lonely paid extra, okay?